facilitate, make sure that there are lots of people, but um, built, into this, built into this program that we can have uh, additional panels purchased that will go to low-income <coughs> households. Um, so we're still working out the details with that. We're seeing if we can work with the city because they're working on um, some pretty major solar installations coming up and we'd like to, to be a part of that. So that's all very exciting. Um, uh, I guess that's it. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Morning. Morning. Welcome. Are you working yeah. with Columbus on their solar initiative? No, inspired by it, but um, no, I haven't. I haven't uh, okay. I didn't know for sure who their solar installer is. Uh, okay. I yeah. know that they have a almost a thousand new solar panels that were this year. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. Any questions for Stephanie? Anybody want to make connections with her? <laughs> Say again what the solar for for all is. That's the that's the cities working with the cities now. It, well, it's working. We we would like to. We're separate. We're working under Siren, which is Southern Indiana mm -hmm. Renewable Energy Network, um, uh, and hoping to work with the cities. We're the city. We're, we're kind of negotiating uh, with them. Um, but yeah, getting uh, basically in a nutshell, working with the solar contractors to work in with their contracts. To, mm -hmm. to get donated panels that will, then we will train volunteers so that we can um, get the panels up on low income houses and um, uh, hopefully at very low cost. And then we'll also be looking for grant money and donations to help with the things that we absolutely have to pay for. So, and with the hope of, you know, as we're recreating this new economy and this new renewable energy um, system. You know, the last thing that we want to do is, yet again, leave people out. And, you know, it, it really it bothers a lot of us that the solar power is available to people who can afford it. Yeah. And people who make enough money to get the federal tax credit, because a lot of people don't. And we'd very much like to have solar power, but, you know, you have, if, if you don't have a lot of money, you pay an extra 30% over somebody who has a lot of money and, and can write it off. So um, that's one of the flaws in the system, I think. So. Are there ways that people want to get involved with your organization that, that they can? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there will be more as time goes on. Right now, if anybody is really moved to just jump in, <laughs> I would love to talk to you. Um, I, probably in the next few months, um, we'll be needing help. Um, you know, everything from training volunteers to actually volunteering to um, uh, canvassing neighborhoods, trying to get people to, to join in, um, put up panels, be in a program, just publicize. Um, and, and putting up panels is actually really fun. I did it at my place recently, and um, yeah, we're kind of... Is, the city, about is the city talking to you about their initiative? Coming up starting next year? Yes. Yeah, I just met with Jackie Bauer yesterday Great. and um, Great. yeah, it's it's really exciting. The one in the that's, Bryant Park neighborhood or are so, they doing so there are actually the a whole bunch of um, yeah. so the, the in the in the Brian Elmheights neighborhood, Siren is working with along with IC, which is the Interfaith Community of Environmentalist Youth. Very exciting to have young people working like this, but they've been going door to door. They have um, enlisted homeowners in, the, in Elm Heights neighborhood to uh, go solar. They've negotiated a, a price with solar contractors so that it really simplifies the project for, for, the, for people who want the solar panels. They don't have to go and interview the, the contractors and make all these decisions. It's just sort of a one-stop shop. Um, and so uh, that's one thing, and that's been a huge success. They've had a double um, the, the interest that they expected, and that's one thing actually that inspired this program. It's like, well, what if all of those houses, what if a little bit could come from each of those houses and go towards um, you know, people who can't afford it? So and then meanwhile, the city is also purchasing, um, they just put out their bid uh, for, for contractors to put panels on City Hall and the police station. And part of what they're doing there is like part B of their plan is, is to um, 
have the contractors, whoever wins this bid, to provide panels uh, at that same bulk purchase rate for residents that sign up. And that's the part that, that we would like to piggyback on so that in that process there will also be a little bit going over to our funds to, to help out. So that's something, though, that, that everybody in the city will be able to sign up for, so definitely watch for that. Um, and that's for this coming year. I think all of that work needs to be done by the end of 2017. In, in the interest of uh, furthering the concept Elaine uh, Elon Musk has uh, done with Tesla to open source ideas, the Gigafactory is coming online and uh, expecting to be producing, uh, I think it's millions if not hundreds of millions or tens of millions of uh, Giga batteries in the next, uh, by 2020. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there for several people that are here that one way that we can break the, the stranglehold that the utility monopolies have over us is I think that we can start using uh, vacant lots, we can use buildings, and you can use those to charge giga batteries and then you could almost have like a uh, like in Indy we have this blue car program, a ride share where you just pick up a car, well what if you picked up a battery pack? So that could be a return on investment model that a lot of people could buy it, you know, one pack at $10,000 or $1,000, whatever it is, but you could have organizations that slowly just purchase more uh, power through battery packs and solar cells on vacant lots or buildings or whatever that they're going to charge and then, you know, these would be subscription battery packs where people would just like take it home and pl plug it in, have their house off renewable, have their car off renewable. So, you know, it might be a, a means for the bottom to feed up instead of, you know, waiting for the top down or the trickle down uh, economic theories of, of renewable energies that we know that the, the big utilities are just going to stand in the way of. So, you know, if we form these little power clubs at the local level and we have them pop up a hundred, pop up across Indiana, that's going to be far more demand to do that model that, that Tesla is supporting and other battery companies are supporting than the utility companies are going to be able to obstruct, you know. So if we do this and decentralize it and there's all of a sudden a hundred or a thousand of these popping up all at the same time once those batteries come online, then you know what, the utility companies are not going to be able to stand in the way of that for too long. Be like your propane gas tank, you know. You take it and replace. You take the the, the discharged battery pack and say, okay, I'm gonna need a full one. You know that could be a way that you buy it once and just just change it. It's cool. It's cool. What you said is it's a, an example of uh, substituting the current corporation that monopolizes the uh, utilities. I don't know, Duke is here in Bloomington? Duke mm -hmm. is here in the utility? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're you know, lukewarm um, uh, on renewable energy. They say they're into it, but they're mm -hmm. not really. So it, it's a similar example with Monsanto. You just substitute it to another way of doing things, where that instead of fighting them to change, you just take that, you challenge them. So, Duke will also change once they will see that they're left without customers, or they will be left behind and uh, too bad, it will be history, because the, the, in any case we're going towards decentralized energy system. Mm -hmm. So who will adapt fine, who not will fall by the uh, wayside. So that's an excellent example of circular economy where you, cut, you use renewable energy, you provide a social good. You scale up a good form of energy. You 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 form another another enterprise than the current one providing energy. So all around, excellent uh, example. Uh, it would be great if you can come and talk about it at our December event in Indianapolis. In any case, we'll promote everything that uh, that you are doing and. Uh, at some point we'll have a place uh, online where we will uh, uh, gather all these uh, uh, good stories and share them with, uh, with everybody. Yeah, we want it to go beyond just this event. So, you know, the things that we talk about here, we want to celebrate and pass it along uh, and kind of more ripples down the road. So, I just have one, uh, it's more of a suggestion, I guess. So uh, the CSL has been working on like doing uh, suggestions and uh, suggest amendments to the comprehensive master plan that the city is working on. And I know that the Sustainability Commission is doing it, the Environmental Commission is doing it, the Food Policy 
uh, council is doing it, and maybe you like taking advantage that you're wearing so many hats, and maybe we can push Siren. I know Siren is part of the CSL, and the CSL is actually working on a statement letter, but maybe if even the projects of the CSL did something similar, and particular, uh, particularly about uh, solar. No, I mean, there are many ways, maybe if the city had a trust where like developers had to put some percentage of money in this trust was used to buy solar panels. Uh, I don't know, to start, like, I think we need to start suggesting more things to the city because I, I don't know if you've read the plan, but it's very limited in like the vision that it has for the future. I think we just have to like some ideas. And, and the city claims that they're eager for people to participate. So I don't know, you seem to be very connected. I think that would help. I, I actually, I, so I, I don't live in the city, I live in the county, and so I confess I haven't really paid attention to that, but uh, right, I should. But can you just say the name of it again? It's the, it's the Comprehensive Master Plan for 20, uh, it's like a vision of Bloomington for year to 2040. It's on the uh, website. It's, it's on, on the, the city's website. website. Yeah. And yeah. you can email me if you want to make this any PDF. Um, and it's so the idea really is, I mean, a lot of groups are just like writing suggestions. I mean, it, yeah, it's a, very, so it's a very limited draft and what it suggests right now, and so I think we have to push the city for it's making it more specific, more specific and giving them ideas about it. Who would like to go next? Oh, I will. <coughs> Nobody else is jumping up. <coughs> First of all, uh, my name is John Gibson. I want to uh, <clears throat> I want to underscore what Sylvia and Gwen have been talking about here. Um, and I want to, to do it uh, as an old man in the crowd. It's taken me a long time to catch on to certain things, but once I catch on to it, then I want to do something about it. I finally figured out, as Sylvia said, economics is, is the basic building block of our society. Um, but the economics we have now that we've been running on is suicide economics. We are, we are literally killing ourselves in the planet. Um, <clears throat> evidence of that is the fact that uh, Global Overshoot Day has been moving. 1970 was along about Christmas time. It's moved up to August 13th this year. What that means is beyond that time of the year, we are actually using up the resources of this planet faster than the planet can replenish them. Uh, that's, that's a recipe we refer to disaster in anybody's budget. You spend more than you take in the end or have a hope to take in, you're going to go bankrupt. And that's what we're doing to this planet. We're in what's called the sixth great species extinction, which means we're we're actually destroying the infrastructure of this planet, the ecological infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> and now we've, we've created this thing called the climate crisis, uh, be, which is pretty much based on the fact that we are, so we have come addicted to money and power that we are polluting the whole planet to death. Uh, question is, can we change this fast enough to save civilization? I mean, is that, is that critical? Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you didn't take with these two people who are well versed in these things as just some, another little talk, just another thing of sort of moderate interest. We are in a crisis like civilization has never, never, ever faced before. Never. And we're the last generation that can do something about it. Now that's, that's the fix we're in. Um, <clears throat> Ten years ago, um, uh, an organization that I'm a part of, that was co-founder of, called uh, Earth Charter Indiana, um, initiated a bicentennial thing because we realized in 2016 we we're going to have a bicentennial. And we were hoping to leverage that idea so that we could start looking ahead and have some sustainability models to celebrate as the bicentennial legacy. So one of my joys over this last 10 years has been to travel around Indiana 
and meet lots of really, really fine people and who are doing really, really fine things and hardly getting any notice about it. So we decided we're going to have celebrations all over this state. We had four or five so far and we got four more to go. Had one in Bloomington two weeks ago. Um, just trying to, to celebrate the, uh, the, the, the new that is emerging. Now, some of it feels kind of old, you know, like uh, sustainable agriculture. I grew up with that. But now we've gone to industrial agriculture, which is killing the planet and causing climate change. Uh, so what we've done is we've, we've, we've got a little book here. Um, I just want to read you the chapter titles because in terms of what we're doing is we're discovering the answers to these questions. Like... Um, how are we going to grow our food in the future if we're going to be, if we're going to live? How are we going to eat? The, the, you know, that's a lot more important than I ever thought. I've tried going vegan and I'm getting pretty good at it, but I read something the other day. Everybody in the world is going to have to eat vegan if everybody's going to eat by 2050. That's it. So, I, you know. I grew up on a small farm. It's not easy for me to swallow, but let's face it, that's the science. These are the facts. Uh, we either eat or we die. And we either eat plant-based diet. Or how are we going to build? How are we going to energize ourselves? How are we going to travel? How are we going to shop? How are we going to deal with our waste and do education and work and build communities? Um, it's been fun, and, uh, it, uh, and I just love going around and celebrating these, uh, we call them green lights now. They're, it's an umbrella term for sustainable models, green practices, and climate solutions. Because actually they're all the same thing. So we just like the word green lights. And so uh, we've added a little feature this year, we call it the Bicentennial Green Legacy Hall of Fame. And we're inducting about 200 of these projects into that Hall of Fame. Um, it's, not, it's not just a gimmick. I, I, I can't say again how important it is that we recognize the people. And I want to give a, I want to give a plug for the Unitarians. Um, Stephanie, you know, your church, and lots of others out there. These people, these people are doing the right things, and by golly, we need to recognize it and follow their example. Because they've got the green light out there, and green light means go. Go in this direction if, uh, if you want our world to be sustainable. So thank you, Stephanie, for what you're doing. I'm excited about this new initiative. Um, thank you for what you're doing. So after, after working on this for 10 years, and believe me, I've been discouraged a lot of times. Some people say, you know, try to give me a little credit for how come I stick around when I'm 83, still doing this stuff. Well, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the green lights I've discovered. I mean, you can get down pretty fast sometimes if you think about what's coming down. And, and I've given up about 30 seconds every day for the last 10 years, but I've kept on the, on the track because there's so darn many good people out there. So anyway, so what we've... And we tried to get some traction at the state level with the governor, with the environmental rules board, with the legislature. I see all of you are, sm are smiling because you know that's a dead end. Oh, just a brick wall. So, and the federals know, be know better. So, how close can we get to the grassroots and bubble up? Um, and um, we think that there might be some traction at the municipal level. So now we're going forward with this idea of, of uh, Indiana Resilient Communities Campaign 2020. 20 municipalities on a fast track to resiliency, which is another name for uh, an active climate action plan, this sort of thing, by 2020. I don't know whether we can do that or not. 
But of course, so Bloomington is, is 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 one of the communities you would you would expect to be on that fast track, wouldn't you? And I think they are. So uh, you know we're 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 you're, you're delighted to hear what Stephanie just said, and and uh, we you know we're talking with the city and this sort of thing. But you know we're caught in a squeeze play here because a lot of cities now. Because of draconian legislation at the state level, which has put a freeze on, uh, a cap on property taxes and so on, a lot of our cities are so strapped for money, they can hardly think other than just how are we going to survive and pay the bills for the next year. Um, at the same time, if we don't make a conversion or a transition, uh, there will be no we'll next it. year, a few we'll years from now. So how do we do this? And, and so we all need to work together on it. Nobody has a final answer. Um, but by golly, we know quite a few things that will work. That will work. So we, we've just got to be as aggressive as we can to get, to get those out there. Um, so that's kind of where I've been, what I'm doing, and why I'm passionate about this yet. I've got grandchildren, some of you do too, or you have children. I've, I've had a wonderful life, and I am so in love with this planet. My heart is broken at the way we are destroying it systematically and quickly because of our addiction to money. And that's why you hear some of these uh, questions about about the corporation, because a lot of us can't hardly stand a corporation who's who's in business to make money. Because if if that's what you do, you only make money if you overcharge your customers or you destroy the environment. I didn't get that for a long time. I think I'm clear about that now. So we so I want to thank uh, our leaders here today for having the courage to. Uh, to hold these conferences, and I just hope that we can we can utilize their wisdom and their experience and the rest of people around the table over the next uh, very few years. I mean, we don't have come on, folks, we don't have till 2050 to get this done. You just read the science, and I know you'll agree with that. We have got to we have got to make rapid changes, and there will be some suffering along the way. There's already suffering. Already a lot. Six million people die every day because of air pollution. Because we because we can't get off from highly polluting uh, coal, etc., etc., etc. We just are so okay. I don't want to get off of my yeah, hobby to, horse here. To but that's, add but that's more to this black view. Uh, <laughs> there, that was what I said, yeah. <laughs> which is realistic, but will will work against it. Uh, the six super polluters. Uh, somebody just I forget which organization just put up a list of all the super polluters in the United States. Six of them, six or four, are in Indiana, yeah. around mm -hmm. Evan. Yeah. Coal plants. So, and here is where cheap is false, right? What do they tell uh, poor communities? Oh, you cannot switch to renewable because it will ruin you. The cheapest source of energy is coal. What we, this is the lies that we have to confront. And with utilities, it's, it's quite easy. You send comments, you show up at all the utility public meetings, uh, you offset your energy so my utility doesn't provide direct renewable energy IPL, I pester them to that. But in the meantime, I offset 100% of it just to give them a signal that I will pay more, more like $1 more, um, to make sure that what they provide me is offset by wind energy. And they started by using only out-of-state wind energy, despite the fact that we have wind farms around Lafayette. And now I see how they're increasing the percentage of it. So there are all kinds of ways, right, to, to cheap at the infrastructure that, uh, that we're in. Uh, we are delighted and very happy to have met John. 
Uh, and uh, uh, it's funny when when we first uh, met at the Disruptive Innovation Festival, he said that oh I didn't know that there are other people in Indiana that are thinking about these things. But I think that's valid for all of us. I mean everybody is doing good things, but we're not connecting them uh, enough. And this is what we want to do. And here we are. Uh, we started uh, a few. We're getting more. Um, uh, and again, I think we, we'd rather uh, change, uh, we'll, we'll transition to a new system about what we do yeah. and uh, through our choices, than uh, hoping that the system uh, will change or will change timely for us. So um, John has been collecting a lot of stories uh, uh, happening throughout Indiana. Indiana is a difficult state. There is no way to put it other way. At the same time, it's much more interesting to change a difficult place than an easy one, right? You know, anybody can change California. Although California will be in a drought for 30 years, so forget California. Um, it's easy uh, to change in a place that is already open to it. But we need to change all the places, in, including the most recalcitrant. So, uh, and Indiana is not the most, it's right somewhere mid-range. Uh, but if we can do it here, and I think on sustainable agriculture, we can do it. It might be more difficult in other aspects. And, and speaking of local budget, if only it would cross their minds to incentivize local economies, to stop incentivizing big corporations to set shop that after they use all the incentives, leave anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so one way to, uh, to, and fortunately we have hopefully a better mayor in Indianapolis now, we should ask him to uh, buy only local and create local manufacturing if they cannot find, and stop this, yeah, let's buy the cheapest one. I don't know if you know the, the one of the craziest examples with uh, California buying the Oakland Bridge from China. Imagine bringing a whole bridge from China, and imagine how good that will be. So you have the steel industry you know, blown up in Indiana and in all the states that have steel industry. You have builders that have built this whole country, and you give all of the state money to a Chinese company. Can I give you a worse example that's happening now? So there's IU's building an informatics building, and IU tries to like keep this nice architecture, and they pay a lot of attention to aesthetics for whatever reason. And so the informatics building has limestone outside, but it was really expensive to process a lot. They wanted it really thin so that it's not such heavy uh, pieces of blocks. So and it's very heavy. I mean, apparently it's very expensive to process it here. So they're shipping the limestone to China to get processed, and then it's coming back and going to the building. So, I mean, that whole that's how you right. would think they would have yeah, a little bit it's more. so heavy. Um, it's yeah, really yeah, 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 yeah. But, it's, yeah. Uh, but that's the thing. It's cheaper for them to send it to China. Uh, obviously, I mean, not factoring externalizing the cost, but it's cheaper for them to send it to China and to actually do it here, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And the cost is China's pollution. You know, I mean, there is a cost, but, but it's not it's it's much in China. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And the offshoring of jobs, right? So speaking of the social aspect, instead of giving the job and limestones from in Indiana, we cannot process now limestone. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Can I just add one thing to what I said? Because I, I think I came off kind of pessimistic, although I didn't feel urgency. But as I think about it, and I see these examples of what's going on in the state, I really think that, it's, that a circular economy and a sustainable future is a lot more fun than what we have now. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's something that we should aspire to. Mm -hmm. Not not just things will change, but I mean, I can see full employment. I can see 30-hour work week. Uh, this is crazy the way we do it. And then we try to do a, a, a democracy when we don't have time to do democracy. We don't have time to hold conversation to well, anyway, I just think, uh, despite the fact that there's a sense of urgency, we're headed, we could, because of this urgency, we could create a society that is really much better than what we have now.
much simpler. Living within our means. Check out the, the website, <laughs> Earth Charter Indiana. So, okay, I'm going to shut up now. And again, what's the name of the book that you read? Oh, Explore Indiana. Okay. Can you get it off the website? You yeah. can, but you should, if you want one, you should buy it from me today rather than okay. just pay the, uh, the shipping cost. That'll kill you, the shipping cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You won't, you won't find it, though, on Amazon. It's not on Amazon, okay. but you but can you buy it from our website. And we're not selling to make money. We just we would like to get some of our costs back. So they're 10 bucks if, if you want one. If you can't afford 10 bucks, they'll sell it to you for... Yeah, and when, when we were in Gary, we donated one to the public library where uh, we had our event, and I think you all know how, what Gary is about. Uh, maybe the, the essence of all the destruction that uh, we've been doing with our current great economic model. Um, so they were very happy to, to receive uh, uh, their book. And again, you know, if, if we can think of uh, a more battered community, I cannot think of uh, uh, another one in Indiana. Um, but, but again, this change will happen because we want it and because we will do it. Uh, again, if we, if we wait for legislation, for politicians, politicians always follow. The, the, so they will follow only when there will be a critical demand for, for this change. But clearly things are happening. I started to say sustainable agriculture. When we first lived in Indiana in the late 90s and I came to school to, to Bloomington, I don't think there was any farmer's market in Indianapolis. Not that I know, except the permanent, not the permanent, the, the city market, which was once per week. Now there are how many? Yeah. And growing. And I see small farmers, you know, some come from near Bloomington, some come from Noblesville. So clearly things are changing because the demand is there. Um, there was only one organic store for in Indianapolis and everybody thought they're crazy that they think they will ever sell organic. Or they, you know, not only they still exist, but now there is a big corporate organic uh, and making it well, uh, uh, whole food. I'm not for a corporate food, but it's a sign that the demand is growing um, at the expense of the current.